uh, seen earlier in the year. So this is a case of a 61 year old gentleman who had COVID around June and presented to us in May um, of this year. So he had COVID in June of 2020. Um, at that time, he only had cold symptoms. About a month later towards July, he developed numbness in his left foot and was seen uh, by an orthopedic surgeon who suggested a steroid taper without improvement, then checked the neck x-ray and afterwards referred him to a local neurologist. Um, he was seen in Georgia for this. After about two months from his initial uh, symptom onset, he uh, was noted to be limping uh, with worsening numbness now in both feet, interestingly in his nose. Uh, and his hands started becoming numb and he felt stiffer in his legs and had to hold on to furniture to walk. Um, the difficulty kept getting worse. By the time he saw a neurologist, most notably in his exam, his reflexes were three plus, and he had a lot of significant pitting edema. He had an initial EMG in that office. Um, even though with his edema, this was technically limited, he was diagnosed as possible CIDP and he was sort of an IVIG without significant improvement with that. Physical therapy was much more helpful over the course of his presentation and helping with his stiffness. Uh, he re did receive, he did not improve with steroids, so he received IVIG. Unfortunately, this was uh, discontinued without any significant improvement. He did have a DVT, so this was, uh, this was held for about four months until it was resumed. Uh, Again, no improvement with treatments. Physical therapy seemed to be helpful with stiffness. And at the time he presented to us, he had much more difficulty walking. He had to use a walker to get into the clinic. And for longer distances, he required to, do, to use a wheelchair, especially for longer days of work. Importantly, he denied any bowel bladder symptoms and any um, uh, diplopia, ptosis, dysarthria, dysphagia, there is no clear upper extremity weakness in his lower extremities. His biggest complaint was more stiffness than weakness itself. Um, his exam was most prominent for hypertonia in bilateral lower extremities to the point that his heel core range had decreased. And he had some weakness in his lower extremities um, in hip flexors and abduction, so sort of in the hip girdle distribution with some weakness in foot dorsiflexion, particularly in the foot that had become numb first. Um, his reflexes were brisk, especially in his legs with four plus patellar, and his gait was also um, very stiff. He, he needed two people to help him walk, and even though his steps were very short, he did have some mild circumduction uh, with both legs. It was fairly symmetric, and he would lean forward to help him walk. He, we repeated his EMG, this is the third one he had had, um, and it was essentially normal. I think these abnormal perineal responses were just a red herring, as this points out. And, and more importantly, the rest of his evaluation was normal. He had no sensory findings and his um, needle study was normal. So when we reviewed his prior studies, we presumed that this was very limited um, due to his degree of edema, secondary to his DBT. So we did not think they were as reliable. Um, his, his prior workup had included brain and spine MRIs that had been unremarkable and normal. And his CSF protein, even though it had been interpreted as elevated, it was only 48. Um, so we considered that as normal as well. So we based our localization mainly from his symptoms of high, uh, and exam findings of hyperflexia, spasticity, and normal cranial nerves and no brain involvement. So we presumed that this was a myelopathy. Um, because we thought it was myelopathy with normal imaging, uh, we tested for uh, a number of labs, but among them, uh, HTLV1 was positive. So that is our working diagnosis at this point. He's been referred to a local infectious disease uh, clinic. Uh, he preferred to follow up locally. So just a short review on HTLV-1. This was first isolated in the 1980s uh, at the time when HIV was being discovered. And um, it is interestingly initially associated with T-cell leukemia lymphoma. 
Although over the years, it was then associated with uh, spastic parapheresis or tropical spastic parapheresis. Um, the infection is quite prevalent around the world, involving 10 to 20 million people. However, um, the disease only presents in less than 2% of those infected. Most of the people get infected through blood-to-blood uh, -blood contact or sexual contact. However, there is a lot of infection through breastfeeding um, into babies, and they may be symptomatic many years later. Um, endemic areas are usually around tropical areas, and in retrospect, this gentleman had had some trips to Nassau and, and the Caribbean in general uh, over 10 years ago. He did deny any uh, other risky behaviors, um, but that was an interesting fact that he had been in an area where this is more endemic. Um, there are no current treatments, unfortunately, that have been proved. Uh, there are some attempts with antiretrovirals. Um, the trials were not uh, very promising. And that's it. That's our short case presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now to introduce today's grand round speaker, I'm going to throw it to Chris. Thanks, Rich. So um, it's my uh, pleasure today to introduce our final speaker in our series of graduating chief residents. Um, I think everyone knows Alan Tesson uh, fairly well. So he joined our program as a PGY2 coming from a previous residency. So a little bit different pathway to, uh, to our door. So Alan has um, done his medical training in University of Florida and then did a medicine residency here at Duke, followed by a few year stint working as a hospitalist for the Department of Medicine. So he's joined uh, neurology, spent the last few years with us showing me how much medicine I've forgotten uh, over the last few years. Every time I round with him and the medical students ask a question, if it's not related to neurology, I just stay silent and hope that he'll answer before I have to. So he's gonna be staying with us for a sleep fellowship and uh, I'm sure he'll go on to big things after that. So Alan, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Dr. Eckstein. All right, let's see if I can share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Okay. And if I go to this, can you see this? Yep. Okay, and do you see my cursor? Yep. All right, well, that's all <laughs> I need. All right, thank you all. Um, so I picked as my topic, the varying uh, manifestations of neurosyphilis, and I'm also gonna use some history as a, as a review uh, to make this uh, kind of fun. Uh, no disclosures. And why should you really care and wanna, wanna really pay attention to this lecture? Uh, first, there's a lot of historical interest, uh, especially with GPI and TABs. These are diseases we don't really get to see anymore but they're in our textbooks and they're on our exams. And I wanted to bring them to life for you guys. That was one of my goals. The second is that I wanna point out to you and convince you right now that reemergence of syphilis is a real problem that's starting to develop in this modern, what I'm gonna call kind of post HIV era. And let me show you this now. These are easily obtainable from cdc.gov. Uh, look at the gray line. These are graphs of rates of reported cases of syphilis uh, to the CDC since they started recording in 1941. And you can see the rate was very high, like 450 per 100,000, but then it essentially melted with the advent of penicillin in 1942. There was a bump in the 80s with the HIV pandemic, but we really hit our our best in the early 2000s. But as you can see, there's this tail that's now been starting to rise. I'm gonna go into that a little further. Again, all this on the CDC, you can look at it, but here's a kind of a heat map of syphilis by, by state. And as you can see, the lower rates are more the yellowy green, and this is not a good map to be Duke Blue. Those would be the highest rates in the country. And you can see that Carolina, North Carolina here kind of sits at the next to top, but if we look by county and you come over here, follow my cursor, and you'll see that this tilted little dark blue county here, that is Wake. 
and the one right next to it here is Durham. So we are in the highest uh, syphilis prevalences, some of the highest syphilis prevalences in the country and rates of reported syphilis. And if you just use your, your eyes and look at the Gestalt, you can see that the trail of blue tracks up the I-95 corridor and shipping and trucking routes up the East Coast. Um, now look on the left side of the screen, and these are these numbers that are worrisome that I was talking to you about. Here's total cases. Um, CDC.gov, look at 2000 was our best year, 31,600 cases. And as we go down, you can see, look how in the last couple of years, we've gone 75, 88, 101, 115, we're up to almost 130,000 cases. This is like quadrupled. So I hope that you'll believe me here that we're in a high prevalence area and rates are increasing. And what we kind of believe is why, why is this so? In the early 2000s, we think that sexual practices and attitudes were probably at maximum safety after HIV uh, kind of changed that the sexual landscape and sexual practices. And then now, are we in this kind of where it's more curable and that are we relaxing kind of sexual attitudes and being less safe? And here's what I ask for you all um, to do for me. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes, and it essentially goes like, the eyes see what the mind knows. And this French philosopher said, the eyes see only what the mind is prepared to comprehend. Uh, I don't think that, you know, this is attributed to many people. Uh, many people throughout history have said it, but it's a beautiful quote. And I want you to get out of this, to prepare your mind. We're going to look at cases and, and just let the images, the stories, uh, the cases, the labs filter into your mind so that when your eyes see a case, you'll be prepared. And that's my goal for this talk. But first, I want you to give me about five minutes for some exciting history, which I think you'll, you'll feel is well worth it. So let me just talk to you about the origins and the name. Now, we don't, what's fascinating about syphilis is we don't really even hear about it and see it in any engravings or illustrations until the 1490s. And this is right around the time when Christopher Columbus came back from the New World. So the leading hypothesis, and it's a very good hypothesis, is that it might be a New World disease that came over uh, back with his crew. Now, there are also good other hypotheses called Old World hypotheses saying that it might have been uh, a more virulent form or a, a transformation of some other more milder disease uh, back then. But um, favoring the New World hypothesis, it was a Spanish physician uh, ended up seeing several members of Columbus's crew after they came back from Hispaniola and um, basically saw syphilis in them. Now, it disseminates then through Europe in the 1500s. And some of these sailors go on to form in the, as conscripts or, or mercenaries in the army of French Emperor Charles VIII. Um, and then these wars, sailing and wars spread it throughout Europe. Uh, and so when the French go to war in Naples, Italy, they carry this epidemic infusion of syphilis with them. And then comes a period where it's a bunch of name calling. Um, the Italians called it the French disease. The French called it the Italian disease. In addition, the Dutch called it the Spanish disease. The Russians called it the Polish disease. The Turks called it the Christian disease. So basically, there was this xenophobic political propaganda and, and smear campaign uh, and where they would all use it to smear uh, their competitors. And to, the, to there, the, the striking parallel with modern day uh, coronavirus, I just couldn't get over. And um, I can't believe it's 500 years in the future. And um, that kind of xenophobia is still pervasive. Um, but who helped us get past this and name this disease? I'm gonna tell you about this Italian scientist named Giuliano Fracastoro. But I wanna give uh, shout outs here to French physician, Jean Fresnel in 1940, or 1546, who gave it the name of Lou which essentially means plague. Lou's venerea was venereal plague. Um, but I wanna talk about the other physician here. And that's this guy right here in the top right. You have him to thank for the name syphilis. He, he doesn't look so happy in the picture, but he's got a heck of a coat. 
Um, and that's Jiro Yamo Fracastoro. He was a physician who also liked to be a poet. Uh, that was a big uh, hobby of his in Verona, Italy. So he wrote this work called Syphilis Sive Morbus Gallicus, which means syphilis or the French disease, which was brilliant because it linked it to the common term at the time, the French disease, and it, it linked the term. And he essentially wrote a poem. He created a character named Syphilis, who was a shepherd. And this shepherd was guarding the, the flocks of sheep of a Greek king. And there was a horrible drought. And uh, the trees were drying up, and, and the ponds were drying up, and the, the sheep were dying. And so upset at his flocks dying, he cursed the god Apollo and said, I'll only worship my king. So Apollo cursed Syphilis, the entire kingdom, and the king with a plague of pox. And all of them went to a nymph named Amarishi to figure out how they could uh, make amends to Apollo and eliminate the disease. And she told him, you had to offer all these sacrifices, including sacrificing Syphilis himself, which they were glad to do. And they did it. And they were cured. And that's how you get Syphilis, everybody. Uh, it is a made up character by an Italian physician poet. Uh, and that's where the name came from. I think that's fascinating. So let's blow through the systemic aspects of syphilis quick and we will then go to neurosyphilis. So starting on the stages for a review, you can't get through any review without mentioning a shanker, but here would be primary lesion. It appears usually 10 to 90 days after exposure, you know, the common sites being the genitals, but this can also occur in the mouth or the anal area. And if left alone, that will disappear in two weeks to two months. Then you can break out into the rash. It can be a full body rash, but involve the palm and soles in 50% of cases. There are oral mucus lesions. Now neuro neurosyphilis, early neurosyphilis can start to make appearances, which we'll talk about. Ocular syphilis, there are condyloma lata, which are these kind of like genital warts. Um, there are other varying presentations. Now when the secondary phase goes away, you enter latent. And we divide it into early and late. And early is simply within one year of either a primary or secondary infection. So it's within one year. And why that's important is that the treatment is different. You only need one dose of penicillin, but also we believe people are more infectious. Uh, in late latent, you don't meet the early criteria. So you just have a serum positivity, you feel well, and you're out at least a year. And then finally, there's some of these tertiary forms here, especially like showing gummas, which are these ulcerating granulomas that can bother the skin, the bone. You can get aortic aneurysms, arteritis. Uh, but that's kind of the cases and, and stages of syphilis. All right, so shift now to neurosyphilis. And here we're going to go over the different kinds. This framework is incredibly important, and I need you to follow it because you'll be lost if you don't get this. Think of your framework for neurosyphilis as early and late. Now, early is quite varied. It can be weeks to months and into the first few years. And I'm going to tell you about asymptomatic and symptomatic. And under symptomatic, you have meningitis, meningovascular, meningomyelitis, gummas, ocular, otologic. Now, the late forms, the best examples, you're talking years to decades, but more decades. And these would be our examples, TABES and general paresis of the insane or GPI. If you look at these frequency maps with me, um, this really highlights the differences between the pre-antibiotic era, meaning like before penicillin, before 1942, and the modern era. And with these triangles, I'm trying to show you that the things that were more dominant to everybody were these later ones, um, like TABES and GPI, where you saw them later. They had time to develop no antibiotic pressure. But now in our modern area, the frequency maps have flipped. And basically, we believe that because of antibiotic pressure, meaning it's harder to incubate the disease this long without somewhere along the way coming in for a cold or a cough or a pneumonia and getting some penicillin and arresting the process. Also, HIV impairing immune systems can lead to earlier breakouts. Um, 
so and also improved uh, testing just improved testing can find it faster so our frequency map is more toward the earlier forms so let's begin and just go over the begin the early forms so the first one is actually probably the most confusing and hard to understand and that's asymptomatic neurosyphilis ironically and i put the this is a great song by the beatles i feel fine but it's apt here because essentially your patient comes in saying i feel fine and by definition there are no symptoms there are no signs you get the diagnosis from blood and csf and so the diagnosis you would have to have some blood serologic evidence no symptoms and then if you tap them they're either going to have one of the following they'll have a pleocytosis which will be lymphocytic elevated protein or a vdrl and i'm sure the next question out of your mind is why would i ever do this and so the most common scenarios where you might see this, um, the, the most advocated is obtaining an LP on a patient with HIV who comes in with syphilis, who has high risk features. So for example, if, if they're not well controlled and their CD4 is low, their viral load is really high, they're not on antiretroviral therapy or their RPR is very high, some people are concerned that they're higher risk of neurosyphilis. So you may LP that person, and even though they say, they say, I feel totally fine, then they get asymptomatic neurosyphilis and they must be treated as neurosyphilis. Please understand, asymptomatic neurosyphilis is still must be treated as neurosyphilis with the longer antibiotic course. Another way we see this is sometimes a provider will just have a patient with like a latent syphilis and just say, ah, let, maybe let's check. And then they get an LP and then they don't know what to do with it. That needs to be treated as neurosyphilis. So that's asymptomatic neurosyphilis. This one we're gonna do quick. It's syphilitic meningitis. It is meningitis. It is a headache, a stiff neck, vomiting. You can't learn a lot from this. It's been studied in the pre-antibiotic era and confirmed in the post-antibiotic era that white counts can be all over the place from low to high. But here's the key, lymphocyte predominance, protein can be modestly elevated all the way to very elevated. The VDRL is almost universally positive. And my clinical pearl for you is do not let a lymphocytic meningitis that's aseptic fool you into assuming viral. Consider syphilis. It can't be cultured right now. Uh, and so, you know, it'll look aseptic, but there you go. Consider that. Let's talk about now cranial neuropathy as, a pre, as an initial presentation of neurosyphilis. Well, essentially this can be classified as a subtype of syphilitic meningitis, but again, these people don't necessarily complain of meningitis symptoms and it can cause just damage to one nerve or multiple. And my tip to you is please keep it in the differential for patients at risk who have even involvement of one cranial nerve. And so over the next slides, I'm gonna show you case report and review of the literature to review cranial neuropathy as initial presentation. So here's a case, a 34 year old man complains that he'd been having a slight left hearing impairment. And then two months later, he gets an acute left facial droop. Not surprisingly, they diagnose him with, they say Ramsey Hunt, he gets prednisone and steroids for 10 days. And while he's getting treatment, he's better. But a day after treatment finishes, the left facial plegia recurs. And then five days later, his right face droops. He gets dysarthria and dizziness. So he has multiple cranial neuropathies. And when you look at his exam, he's got bilateral facial plegia, now more profound on the right. He can't hear out of his left ear well, and he has dysarthria. And we go look at the brain MRI on the right. And at the top up here, you can see this is an axial T1 with GAD. And you can see the facial nerve complex over here on the left enhancing, showing, like you had said, you have a cranial neuropathy inflammation. And then at the bottom on the coronals post-GAD, you can see some enhancement of the facial nerve and cochlear nerve complexes. And these are highlighted by the arrows. So what they did is they checked the blood and they found an HIV antibody, positive HIV PCR, and a normal CD4 count. The treponemal test, TPPA, treponemal pallidum uh, particle agglutination was positive along with a non-treponemal VDRL. So he has syphilis, it's active. 
Then the blood is, or the CSF is checked. Glucose is normal. The protein is elevated. There is a lymphocytic pleocytosis. This is concerning. And then you have a VDRL also. So he has active neurosyphilis. This paragraph just says they exhaustively looked for everything else and didn't find it. They diagnosed with neurosyphilis. They gave the appropriate treatment, which is PENG, 4 million units every four hours for two weeks. And then he had major improvement in his face strength. Hearing was still somewhat impaired at six months, but his CSF and MRI normalized. And so this group that presented this case did a review of the literature and they went back 40 years and looked at reported cases of neurosyphilis with first presentation of a cranial neuropathy. And you can see cases from 2017 all the way back to 1978. And I want you to focus on the bottom, which I'm gonna blow up for you here. So there were 25 cases. Now, some cases had more than one nerve. And so these don't add up to 25, but look at the nerves most involved. You have oculomotor, which was eight, trochlear two, trigeminal five, abducens one, facial 11, vestibular cochlear 10, and vagus one. So uh, a, a clinical pearl for you here, is watch out for things that you're gonna call Bell's palsies or Ramsey Hunt. Watch out if it involves the, you know, the face and also the hearing. And if it worsens after your treatment, especially in somebody at risk, think about neurosyphilis cranial neuropathy. All right, quickly here, meningovascular syphilis. This is just when the meningitis caused by syphilis begins to start leading into an arteritis and affecting those, those arteries. And as it inflames the arteries, it can involve any vascular territory. It can cause thrombosis and stroke. Now, any territory, including anywhere in the brain or spinal cord can be affected, but the MCA territory is most often. And this is not a diffuse arteritis. This is not diffuse like a CNS vasculitis. It's isolated. It's small segment. It's often unilateral. And my clinical pearl for you is that anybody who has an unexplained stroke, especially anybody young with a stroke who lacks traditional risk factors and is sexually active, please check them for meningovascular syphilis. That is your pearl. Here's one we don't really think about, and this is ocular syphilis. Um, the chief complaint is usually that their eye gets red, uh, they might have some pain, their vision blurs and visual loss. Um, and any part of the eye can be involved, but usually it's a pan uveitis or a posterior uveitis. And I can imagine the cases where we might run into that is we could run it into it either with an MS evaluation for like optic neuritis, or also maybe an acute headache evaluation where the patient's clutching their eye and saying, I have some discomfort and blurry vision. So just imagine that maybe in a consult for that, you guys might run into this. I wanna let you know most commonly this presents during the secondary syphilis phase, but it can occur shortly after, a year after. Um, and in one case series, 12 of 31 of these patients with ocular syphilis who got tapped with an LP had the VDRL, so about 40%. And because that tissue is neural tissue anyway, like the retina, this is treated as neurosyphilis. It has to get, again, the two weeks. Now, my neighbor, Kristen Dix, uh, is an ID attending at Duke. And this is what she says she actually sees very commonly here in Durham is quite a bit of ocular syphilis. So um, here is another one. And this one's pretty fascinating. Uh, CNS gumma. Um, this is not gum or gummy bears, which start to pop in my mind when I see gumma, but gummas are granulomas, caseating granulomas, caseating center, multinucleated giant cells, you know that. And then what they do is we think that they're a meningovascular syphilis that then starts to extend from the meninges impinge on the brain tissue and it can mimic a brain tumor. And I wanna show you over here on the right, look at the picture and I'll bring my cursor over here. This is from the up-to-date neurosyphilis by a very prominent author, Christina Mara in the field. And they show that 
on this contrast enhanced T1, you can see this focal area of meningeal enhancement. And then clearly you can see the edema down into the brain parenchyma here. And then when you look on a flare, you can see all the edema here on the flare, okay? So this is a gumma. And then the symptoms make a lot of sense. If you have a meningeal process, you could block CSF flow and cause hydrocephalus. If you're bothering the cortical surface, you could have seizures, or it could just be an incidental finding. And then here's something is in, in the largest series to date of 21 gummas that were definitively diagnosed that got tapped, 13 had a, CNF or a CSF VDRL. And this is the point to highlight is that VDRL is essentially our, one of our best tests right now, but it doesn't have perfect sensitivity. It's about 75%, and it depends on which neurosyphilis you're looking for. But here, I'm going to go further into CNS gumma with a case report and review by Fargan, who is a neurosurgeon at University of Florida. And this is pretty fascinating. So his case is that a 61-year-old male in November of 06 comes in and gets diagnosed and treated for secondary syphilis. Pretty classic is RPR is positive at a 1 to 32 titer. The HIV is negative. And after a great, you know, normal treatment, comes back in March of 07 complaining of two months of worsening cognitive troubles and having seizures now characterized by deja vu. On exam has a left homonymous hemianopia and the MRI is over here on the right. You can see this right parieto occipital lesion here on T2. And this doesn't have enhancement, but there's extensive edema. And then when you look down here at the sagittal, this is a sagittal T1 with contrast. That looks a lot like a meningioma. It's got uniform enhancing character and it seems to have a dural tail. And then it's pressing in with this edema. Well, let's go back to the blood in the CSF and see what they found. Well, when they tested the blood, the RPR titer had fallen to one to four. Now that's an eightfold improvement, which generally indicates that's a good response to treatment. The HIV was negative. They checked some toxoplasma, which was negative. And when they tapped him, they got really reassuring findings. The cell count was normal. Protein was normal, glucose was normal, VDRL was non-reactive. So the neurosurgeon said, okay, this is a meningioma, let's cut it out. And then during surgery, they get this back and the pathologist says, well, there's a bunch of inflammatory cells and you have treponemes in here, you're cutting out a gamma. And so they were fascinated by this and he goes on to do a review in neurosurgery fashion and overachieving fashion of 156 cases. It's a seven page article that I read and five pages are his references. Um, but things that he found out were that, um, and here he did descriptive characteristics. So I'll share a few highlights of what we can find is that it's kind of a middle-aged disease in the thirties and forties, male predominance two to one, the presenting signs and symptoms are most commonly headache. You can have seizure, hemiparesis, um, but it depends on the location. As I told you, the CSF positivity of VDRL, this is the largest case series. And again, it's about 62%, so it's not the most sensitive. And then if you look over on table two here, some of the best information is that where are these usually found? The vast majority are found over the convexities all around the brain, but out at the convexities. Now, the second highest place, if you come down here, would be the pituitary in 9% of cases involving the pituitary. And then the imaging is pretty classic. If we just come down to the MRI at the bottom here, you'll see that on T2, it's more likely to be T2 hyperintense, every single gamma contrast enhanced. And then a, over a third of them had meningeal enhancement and a dur dural tail. And then there is quite a few that have perilesional edema. So again, regarding gummas, if I give you a pearl, if you have kind of a funny focal enhancing meningeal based lesion and an individual at risk for syphilis, please consider gumma. And again, there can often be underlying cerebral edema.
Well, let's shift now and just talk a little about the spinal cord. Um, here is different ways at the top that syphilis can affect the cord. Uh, meningomyelitis, where you're getting the meninges and the cord. Hypertrophic pachymeningitis with a polyridic. Meningovascular syphilis, like I talked about, that can cause strokes in the cord or spinal gummas. But I want to talk about this meningomyelitis. And it presents on, uh, if you add up all these case series, on average about six years after infection, but it can be anywhere from either months to, to longer. And I need you to know, please don't make the mistake. This is not TABES. This is not TABES. This is an inflammatory meningomyelitis. I'll discuss TABES later. But let's go over another case in a review so that you can put this in your head. So this is subacute syphilitic meningomyelitis by the group Kikuchi et al. And a 36-year-old gets pain on the right shoulder. It spreads across the neck to the other arm over weeks. And then there's increased difficulty walking over further weeks. Well, this sounds like it's clearly the cord. And when you look at the labs, the serum, the HIV was negative but the treponemal test was positive with a high titer. And then on the tap, here again, 350 white cells with 99% lymphocytes and an elevated protein. Now they didn't do a VDRL, but they did two treponemal tests on the CSF that were high titer. And then they imaged the cord, and this is what they found. So they found on T2, this basically um, swollen, a uh, hyper intense signal uh, through the cervical cord. And then when they did contrast, they found this kind of lumpy contrast enhancement here coming in from the surface. And they thought this was a specific finding and they wanted to label this and describe it in their report as guttering, uh, which is essentially what a candle does when it overburns and develops a lot of wax like this, it kills the flame, which is called a guttering um, phenomenon. And so this looks almost kind of like the dripping wax of the candle. And uh, that's how it gets that name. Plus they, they designated something called the flip-flop sign, which is in the area that's enhancing. There's a little darker. It doesn't, it's not as T2 bright. It flip-flops and it's darker gray. So they thought this might be a specific sign for neurosyphilis, but it's not. Um, this is actually more. And so here's another group, Toge et al., um, who found another case of uh, meningomyelitis. And the key here that, that we're going to come out of this is longitudinally extensive. So as you can see in their case, from C4 all the way down to T6, there's kind of this patchy and partially continuous high-intensity signal in the cord. And then on the axials, it's more central. And then when you go to the enhancement, the enhancement is kind of surface enhancement. This is not a good image, but it is more surface enhancing with these little dots. And then after treatment for neurosyphilis, again, the T2 changes resolve. And so then this group did a review of 12 cases of meningomyelitis and added their case, so 13 in total. And here's some of the things they came out. Uh, the mean age is, again, kind of a middle age 42 vast majority were male. You can't go on duration of symptoms. It can be acute from a matter of days to all the way to six months. But here's some things we could take away is that 11 out of 13 patients had longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis and GAD enhancement in the superficial or central part of the cord was observed in over half of cases. And they thought that this might reflect direct treponemal invasion into the cord from the surface which is again, they were wondering with this guttering appearance, is it more prominent at the surface and driving its way into the cord? Sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. So my pearl is please put syphilitic myelitis on the differential of any longitudinally extensive myelitis that you don't have a clear answer for. It can clearly be longitudinally extensive disease. And every patient with an unexplained myelopathy, you need to check syphilitic serology because it is curable and it is somewhat nonspecific. And now I want to finish with some of the late forms, um, general paresis and tabies. And here's the sad part is when you open up a review book now, 
you start to see things like this and there's there's just it's bare bones and this is all you see but you you have to memorize this little bit of stuff for the test it'll say like well it goes by different names general paresis or general paralysis of the insane which is gpi or dementia paralytica and essentially what i can gather out of this is well the patient gets dementia and they also get weak um, and then they'll say often heralded by psych symptoms and then dementia and seizures uh, one third have Argyle Robertson pupils, which isn't as common as in Tabies, but can have dysarthria, tremors, and a variable pleocytosis and other findings in CSF. Well, this has no life to me. So what I want you all to do is let's go back uh, about 140 years and let's see what it was like back then. So uh, I want everybody to look at the picture on the left and imagine you're there. Uh, this is West Riding S Asylum in Wakefield, Northern UK. Um, the year back where we are now is 1887. You're a medical officer and you're up in one of your offices here at the asylum. Yeah, you're an alienist, which was actually a term for a psychiatrist back then. And in they bring in 33-year-old Patrick Kay. And here's the chief complaint as they bring him in. They said he's too unruly for staff of Bradford Workhouse. He's shouting and fighting with the other residents. Now, a workhouse is a place where the poor went um, who could earn room and board and, uh, and like food uh, by doing work. But he was getting in fights. And his brother writes you a letter and says, Patrick had contracted the ladies' disease years ago and was very much prone to drink and bad habits. And now the irony here, it was really a horny men's disease because five to one were men and it just highlights the misogyny of the era. Um, and then on exam, you mark down in your book, his speech was slurred, no reflexes. He could walk in a peculiar staggering fashion. His balance was poor and he had fallen on more than one occasion, but mentally he had a buoyant mental state. He was good humored and elated. He had grand ideas about his abilities and future plans. And he had told the doctors he traveled to the East Indies where he was adored by everyone. He had a room full of gold watches to give away and he painted the most beautiful pictures fetching a thousand pounds each. And so you write in your book, diagnosis mania with general paralysis, prognosis unfavorable. These are exact words from the book of the physician that was there at this time. And a year later, Patrick had died. Um, almost everybody back then died within three years. 50% died within a year. And what the striking thing about this case was this was a completely average case. It was not unusual. This was the average at the time. And it was mirrored in asylums all across Britain in the 1800s. And this was a huge, I cannot stress to you guys how socioeconomically devastating it was because these men were in the prime of their lives. They were generally fit, hard workers who got this disease. And then the telltale signs were many of them had this kind of grandiose delusions or mania. And then poor reflexes changed. They might have um, the pupils, their voice trembled, and then they could get some uh, trembling of their lips and tongue. And then a spastic paresis set in later. And by your 1880s, 20% of your asylum admissions were these people. And 34% of every death at the end of the year was these people. And here, let's jump with this picture. And I'll explain it in a second to the 1930s. And how far have we come since Patrick in the 1880s? Well, in 1913, Hideo Noguchi had isolated spirochetes from the brains of patients with GPI. And that proved the link with syphilis. And then in 1927, this gentleman in the back of the picture right here, that's Julius Wagner, an Australian physician who was interested in high fevers and mental illness and pioneered a drastic treatment called malarial treatment, which he won the Nobel Prize for. And essentially, this man in the middle has GPI, and that man next to him has malaria. And they took the blood from this man and injected it into this guy, giving him malaria. The high fevers would kill the treponemes, and then they would rescue him with chloroquine. And thank God, in 1942, penicillin came out, and we moved on to this therapy. Which I want to tell you about one other famous GPI patient, and that's Al Capone. And he was born in 1899 in Brooklyn, 
And when he was a low level bouncer at a bordello, he caught syphilis, but he hid it from everybody. And he was just kind of too ashamed. And there was no real treatment anyway that was good. So then he goes on to rise to a prominent status as a gangster in prohibition era Chicago. He kills a bunch of competitors, but he gets well known. And finally, this catches up with him and he gets in prison for tax evasion in, in 1931. And he's in prison for eight years. And he's a famous um, inmate of Alcatraz after it opens in 34. But he got diagnosed. He started getting demented in Alcatraz. And he was friendly to the guards, but he would do crazy things like wear his like winter clothing in a hot summer day. And he started just being demented. And so they diagnosed him with GPI. And they released him in 1939 uh, from his medical condition and good behavior. Well, let me look at the top right picture. Immediately, his family took him across country to Johns Hopkins, who wouldn't let him in the door because of his, um, his issues with you know, his history. And so he went across the street to this Union Memorial in Baltimore, where they took him in and a famous syphilologist named Joseph Moore treated him. And, Capone and his family were so appreciative that they left in donation these weeping Japanese cherry trees, which still stand there today outside the hospital. So from there, he went to his home in Miami in 1940. And because he had received penicillin, and he was one of the first patients to get penicillin in history, um, but it was too late. He was already kind of hallucinating and having seizures. Um, but this is him in the bottom left picture with his family. So this man right here has GPI. Um, but the penicillin helped him live longer. He lived seven more years. The FBI put operatives at local clinics to keep an eye on him. Uh, but he was never a threat as uh, what his doctor said, his syphilologist said that the treatment had increased Capone's mentalin and IQ from that of a seven-year-old to a 14-year-old. However, he's still silly, childish, and mentally deteriorated that he wrote in a letter to Capone's Florida doctor. And then this was Palm Island off Miami, which was his house. And in his last year of life, he wandered around the property with pajamas on, looking for lost treasure and talking to dead old friends. And he ended up dying of a stroke and seizure. But what was a nightmare to me is that this gangster who murdered people got penicillin and these men didn't. And the thing is this, I need to tell you even briefly about the Tuskegee study, which was this really ethically abusive study between 32 and 72 by the US Public Health Service and the CDC. I didn't know that they were such big players in this. I thought it was more tied to Tuskegee University in Alabama, which was the coordinating center. Um, but I did not know that for 40 years, this came from the top of our public health institutes, and the purpose was to observe the natural history of untreated syphilis in African American men. And what they did is they found 600 impoverished African American sharecroppers from a local county in Alabama, and that 399 had had latent syphilis and 201 weren't infected. And so, but they didn't tell them they had syphilis. And now, before this began, there really wasn't a good treatment anyway. But clearly 10 years later, penicillin was out and all they told him was this local colloquial term, oh, we're here to test you for bad blood and we'll help you get treated if we find stuff. And as an incentive, they gave him free exams, free meals and burial insurance. But once they found out, and even after penicillin was available, they didn't treat these men. And unfortunately, many died, their wives were infected and some of their children were even born with congenital syphilis. And a year later, after a whistleblower stopped this in 1972 by leaking this to the press, the Department of Health and Human Services did establish a survivor benefit program. And then President Bill Clinton apologized in 97. But this has left a de devastating legacy uh, of just racism and abuse in research. And uh, I just encourage all you all, it'll, it'll make your teeth chatter to read it. It'll make you mad, but I think we all need to. And to finish more on an uplifting note, let's talk briefly about Tabies. Um, I never knew about the name that well, and it frustrated me, but it's actually well, well named. Tabies means wasting of a body organ or part, and dorsalis simply means the back. So you waste the back of the spinal cord right here, like on this myelin section. And once again, if you look at it here, like in a modern day review, all you'll see is like shooting pains, abdominal crises, sensory ataxia. 
and, and this is just devoid of any life or substance. And so what I did, I went back and here is a manual of the nervous diseases of man by Moritz Romberg. And yes, you are right. That is the Dr. Romberg of the Romberg sign. And this is published in 1853. And this stuff is gold, an entire chapter on Tavis dorsalis. And I just have to read you excerpts. Uh, oh, I can't read the top there because it's under the screen share. But um, the first symptom is loss of motor power of the muscles. The patient complains of weakness and inability to perform any movement or endure any position for a continuance. The practiced rider is unable to hold on, hold on to his horse as long as usual. Early in the disease, we find the sense of touch and the muscular sense diminished, while the sensibility of the skin is unaltered in reference to temperature and painful impressions. The feet feel numbed, a sensation as if the sole of the foot were in contact with wool, soft sand, or a bladder filled with water. The rider no longer feels the resistance of the stirrup and has the strap put up a hole or two. The gait begins to be insecure and the patient attempts to improve it by making a greater effort of the will. As he doesn't feel the tread to be firm, he puts his heels down with greater force. From the commencement of the disease, the individual keeps his eyes on his feet to prevent his movements from becoming still more unsteady. So I thought this was great. Like the review of systems you asked back then were about horse riding. And I wonder if like they asked demented people, like, did you take away their saddle? Um, that was an interesting thought that popped in my head. And I'll just read the top here, but if he's ordered to close his eyes, I can't read the top there, but something like while standing, he at once commences to totter and swing from side to side. The insecurity of his gait also exhibits itself more in the dark. It's now 10 years since I pointed out this pathognomonic sign, which would be Romberg's sign. And then this is fascinating. Some patients mention the circumstance without being asked. One gentleman whose eyesight was unimpaired told me that he was at present unable to wash himself in his dark bedroom while standing. If he wished to keep his balance, he was obliged to have a light while performing his toilet. Another whose business rendered it necessary for him to go out at six in the morning complained that he required someone to support him in the house and outdoors, but he could dispense with assistance in full daylight. So he goes on to show and then painful sensations here. Um, and even right here, he describes, this would be the Argyle Robertsons. The condition of these unfortunate individuals is rendered more distressing by the circumstances that amblyopia often supervenes, which is loss of vision. Even when the optic nerve was not implicated, I've repeatedly found a change in the pupils of one or both eyes, consisting in a contraction with loss of motion, which in one case attained to such a height that the pupils were reduced to the size of a pin's head. And so he also said right here that the majority don't complain much and they're inclined to represent their condition, condition, especially to the medical man in a too favorable light. If they're members of the higher classes, they anxiously endeavor to conceal their loss of motor power in order to avoid the evil reputation of being affected with tabies. Now Charcot went on to describe the pains beautifully, which I'm gonna skip here, but he likened them to an awl, which is down here. This is an awl and it's used to punch holes in, in uh, cloth, especially leather for like sewing. And these were piercing pains. And also Charcot's arthropathy, which these patients could get in their knees. And then you had famous contemporaries of them during this period, like French writer Alphonse Daudet, who would get tabies, go visit Charcot. And then Charcot mentioned suspension therapy to him, which is documented here where they basically hung people by their necks and arms for a length of time to help their tabies improve. It caused him tremendous hemoptysis, so he hated Charcot after that and never visited him again. And I'm gonna finish right here with tabies in the present. And I just wanna show you a, a video and we'll be done. But I hope you can see this video. But here, There's the feet everted. 
the sensory ataxic gate. Here's Argyle Robertson pupils, not constricting to light. But they are restricting to near. Loss of proprioception. Loss of vibration sense, and he's getting the jilting pains. Okay. And essentially, sorry. And then if you MRI it modernly, as in this case, you'll see atrophy of the cord with bright signal. And then back here, look right there, right in the dorsal columns is where the signal intensity is. So I hope that as I reviewed these with you, um, basically you can load your mind up. And like I said, the eyes see what the mind knows that you saw some things. And if it ever comes across, maybe it'll pop in your head to think about syphilis and neurosyphilis. Thank you all. Thanks, Alan. Uh, great job. So uh, Rich had to go to another meeting real quick. So I'll uh, stay on and we can probably have time for a couple of questions if anybody has them. I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, these do pop up every once in a while. I know I've seen a, a few over the last few years, um, you know, one, once or twice a year, they tend to come through. It looks like uh, the ICU seen a couple this year as well, looking at the comments. Uh, Chris, just a quick question. Yep. Alan, you did a great job summarizing everything. Could you just uh, summarize quickly the, the serological tests and just where to use them and when not to use them? Yeah. And sorry, I just kind of ran out of time on that and just couldn't put everything in. But here's here's an example of what you would do. And the key is if you have a patient, this is says without HIV, but you need to first establish in the serum that this person has had syphilis. And the key is, is not that you need to use a treponeme or the non-treponeme. You need to use both. They work together because once you have the positive treponeme, it'll stay positive for life. And that proves that somebody had an infection, doesn't necessarily mean they still have it. And then the non-treponemal if positive shows that they have it now. And so all tests at Duke, you guys don't need to worry about this, are actually done now in the reverse testing order. So you order, Duke does the fluorescent treponemal antibody absorption in the serum, and then it reflexes to an RPR. So you automatically get both every time. So that's the one you order as your serum test. So if you have the FTA absorption positive and an RPR, you know you've got active disease. If you have the FTA absorption in the serum positive and the RPR is negative, then you're recommended to go to another test like um, the particle agglutination to make sure it just wasn't a false positive. And then what you do is if you have any neurologic, otologic, or ocular symptoms, you do a tap. And on the tap, the main one you do, you do VDRL. It's been the best, and that's the one you do. And if your VDRL is reactive, you've nailed the diagnosis, you have neurosyphilis. If your VDRL is non-reactive, you look at the white count next. If it's abnormally high, which is over five, in a condition where they have syphilis and it's possible, then you have neurosyphilis and you treat. If the white count's fine, then you look at the protein. If the protein's elevated, Again, you diagnose neurosyphilis and you treat. So you go down through those options, VDRL, white count, then protein, and you treat. That's your way to do it. All right, any other questions? You're getting some kudos in the comment section, uh, Alan, but I don't see any other questions. So uh, since we're a little over, we can go ahead and call it there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Great job. Thank you.